Machine learning, it's a term often used, but not always understood in the world of technology. Every day, new innovations, products, and capabilities are introduced and adopted by people all over the world. But there is a bit of a disconnect between researcher and consumer. How is a system trained? Why does it make certain decisions under certain conditions? What kind of reasoning goes into its decision making and how can we trust that its choice is informed, objective, and ultimately correct? We're speaking today with Assistant Professor Matthew Gambale, a researcher in human-robot interaction in Georgia Tech School of Interactive Computing. He'll help us try to demystify the ever-expanding field of machine learning. I'm Ayanna Howard, Chair of Georgia Tech School of Interactive Computing, and this is the Interaction Hour. Matthew Gambale joined IC in 2018 after earning his PhD in autonomous systems from MIT in 2017. His research interests span robotics, AI and machine learning, human-robot interaction, and operations. In 2018, he was selected a DARPA riser, and he earned the NASA Early Career Faculty Award earlier this year. Matthew, thanks for joining us. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. So I want to start with this NASA Early Career Faculty Award. Um, I kind of like NASA, and so I want to know, what is this award about? I like space, too. The award this year is focusing on scaling the power of the astronaut to conduct science, um, even if the astronaut can't be there, or perhaps to enable machines or robots to support the astronaut as uh, science exploration teammates. And there was a call for such proposals um, that NASA puts out every three years. The topic will cycle through, and this year it was human-robot interaction. And uh, I was very fortunate to have that timing uh, early in my career and be able to go for the award. So you know this means we're going to have an astronaut. It just has to be. I'm hoping, let's fingers crossed, astronaut and robots together at Georgia Tech. I mean, I would like that. All right. My, I'm working on it with my wife and uh, my son. I think the deal is that they go with me, um, and then we can bring our robots uh, to help us along the way. Good, good. Okay, so this, this thing about robots and astronauts and basically robots augmenting the ability, the power of astronauts. Um, so how is, is that done? Like, what is this concept? And I'm assuming it's about learning. Yeah, absolutely. Um, today, most of what happens on Mars um, and in space with robotics is done uh, in one of two ways. The first is that humans will almost literally teleoperate. That means to remotely control through something like a glorified Xbox controller um, and looking at images from satellites and from the robot itself to look around at the landscape and figure out what commands do you send to the wheels and to the arms to be able to move to an object of interest, say a rock that has some interesting features that you want to take a sensor measurement of. And it's very difficult. And the time delay that's induced by sending commands is on the order of tens of minutes. And so that means you have to wait a very long time to get feedback from every time you send a command to a wheel or to an arm. And I'm interested in figuring out if, if machines can be taught, just like a human would teach an apprentice or a student, how to perform these navigation and science tasks, perhaps in an environment on Earth, and then maybe these robots can start trying to recreate that on their own on another planet. And this idea came from inspiration that I had uh, going to see the Behringer Crater. Um, actually, at AAAI 2015 in Phoenix, I think I took a pit stop and drove a couple hours and had my father meet me out there. It was a bucket list thing. And we saw that um, there was a little uh, cardboard cutout of an astronaut down at the base of this crater that represented uh, the Apollo astronauts being trained in how to do field geology from actual PhDs in geology. And then those astronauts were able to go to the moon and basically replicate what it'd be like for a geologist to be there. Now, we're not quite there with robots and having PhDs train robots in, in field geology, but that's the ultimate vision of this work, is to enable robots to learn just as those astronauts did 
how to go uh, afar and, and scale the power of those scientists in, in uh, physical locations that they couldn't go themselves. So this concept, this, this uh, robots learning, uh, being taught just as humans, um, I think this is what we would define as uh, this area of, of machine learning. Um, so let me poke a little bit on that. Um, so there's a lot of folks out there that aren't in the research space, that aren't necessarily in machine learning. Um, there's a lot of hubbub, media, like rah, rah, rah. Um, and machine learning is also interchangeably used with artificial intelligence as well. So I want to poke a little bit about your thoughts on this concept of robots and machines of the future and this definition of machine learning and how it differs from artificial intelligence. Yeah, um, you'll often see that people write AI slash ML, and they typically mean that as an or, um, or that they're equal in their topic or field, and that's, that's really a misnomer. Um, AI is a field of study, I say within mathematics, computer science, that focuses on being able to understand and replicate intelligence, most often human intelligence, as we are the highest form of intelligence that we know of. But I suppose it won't stop there. Um, and it encompasses a broad variety of techniques. You may think uh, of a more of a classic human programmed machine that writes, I, I write a bunch of rules. For example, my car, I want it to speed up if there's nobody in front of it and I slow it down if there's somebody and if I'm about to get into a crash. You can write those rules and that's typically how we did expert-based systems decades ago. Today, we rely on, often rely on machine learning techniques, which tries to infer what those rules are from looking at patterns of data. But really, machine learning is a subfield within AI that uses a special set of tools that are often useful when we can't write the rules ourselves. If I don't know what my car should be doing, but I can show it what to do, well, then I can use a machine learning algorithm to figure out what those best rules would have been if I could articulate them. And that's particularly powerful in, in a couple of cases. One, if the data that we want to learn from uh, comes from nature, we can't figure out what the model is ourselves. And so we could potentially use those machine learning algorithms to do it for us. Um, the other is, is in learning from people. Often people have a hard time articulating what decisions they make. The PhD geologist could have a really hard time if you said, give me a list of how to be you. Give me the 10 rules of being a geologist. Instead, what we can do is um, watch them conduct their own geology and try to, through observation and statistical correlation, back out what are the likely explanations for why they're doing that behavior. But there's a caveat at the end of the day. We don't really know why. It is just correlation. So based on what you're saying, AI intelligence is maybe the mind and machine learning is the way that we get knowledge into that mind? It could be a form of knowledge acquisition. Yes, how do you extract knowledge or facts from data? Identifying patterns, so pattern recognition is a common way of describing it. And so how does this apprenticeship learning, which you had mentioned, is, is that AI, machine learning, combination of both? Yeah, um, people do look at AI and machine learning methods to do it, but it's um, almost exclusively an area where you use machine learning tools. Um, you, as a researcher, try to develop the right equations to extract what you need from the data. And then you watch a human make decisions. And you can learn some really interesting patterns. For example, um, there was a study done in which you'd have expert chess players. And you'd set them up to win in, for example, three moves. And then you would change something about the board, and you would tell them to try to win. You would track their eyes, and you also listen to what they tell you. And you see that their eyes um, and what they tell you are actually completely different things. They will tell you that they're looking all over the board, looking for novel patterns and um, novel sequences that could potentially enable them to reach checkmate. But their eyes simply trace out the same three-move sequence that is infeasible over and over again. There's, um, it's known as an Einstellung, which is essentially German for habit. 
and that experts often find themselves at, at a disconnect between what they do and what they think they're doing. And so I take the perspective that, with, with all due respect, we can't really listen to what experts say as much as watching them do what they're so good at and try to back out what that decision-making process is. And machine learning is the way that we do that. So, so if I think about this aspect of apprenticeship learning, you're thinking of applying it to NASA. NASA. Oh, I, actually, I think I have a new word. We're going to call it astronaut intelligence. Very right? cool. So Very cool. the robots are going to be modeling or learning astronaut intelligence. Um, and this is a space kind of domain. What other things can you use apprenticeship learning in? Yeah, there's a lot. Um, many of my, my colleagues have been looking at apprenticeship learning from everything from simply learning to pick and place blocks um, to robotic assisted surgery. Um, there's work um, at Johns Hopkins that's looked at hysterectomies and trying to figure out how, what are ways of replicating how a surgeon performs certain elective procedures. Um, I am particularly interested in looking at apprenticeship learning as a way of, of extracting knowledge in, in healthcare, the healthcare space. And so my, my prior work, actually, I was privileged enough to be on the labor and delivery floor of Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center for two years. I got basically all the fun of being a third year medical student without any of the responsibilities. So it's like just the fun stuff. Um, I mean, was asked to write a note and it was like a doctor's note, and it was absolutely horrible. Um, but I didn't get yelled at. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I'm incredibly grateful to to Neil Shaw and Tony Golan, doctors at Beth Israel, who helped me and mentored me through that. And we were very interested in looking at charge nursing in the labor and delivery floor. Charge nursing, if you're not familiar with it, it's essentially like running air traffic control, but in a hospital and women in labor don't respond to commands like pilots in a cockpit of a commercial airline. Um, you can't just tell a woman, like, deliver in the next two minutes. Like, that doesn't work. Um, and there's incredible variety in stochasticity, so uncertainty in the problem. And these charge nurses currently work without any decision support. They learn everything they do through decades of their own apprenticeship from more expert nurses, senior nurses. And none of it's ever written down or codified. And unfortunately, about half of them quit the job by the time I finished my dissertation because of burnout, fatigue. They had no decision support, no tools to help them. And I was looking at, can we use apprenticeship learning to figure out how to codify their knowledge and be able to provide that as decision support for more novice nurses or even um, a nurse who is an expert who might benefit from kind of just a sounding board or a second perspective. And every time I showed up, um, I, I'll admit I was a little worried that they would think I'm trying to automate their job. But actually what they said is, Matthew, where's my robot? Matthew, where's my robot? I need help. And it was both gratifying that maybe I, as a lowly engineer, could actually make a difference in, in people's lives and in healthcare. It was also like daunting thinking like, how desperately they needed something that I was just starting to figure out as a PhD student. And at the end of the day, we, we filtered a robot that only took about two hours uh, to learn from observing the charge nurses' decision making, how to coordinate patients and doctors on the labor floor. We got about 90% of the acceptance of the advice we generated accepted in only about two hours of training. And the nurses thought it would be great for, for training uh, for training purposes. And, and ultimately, one day, I hope that it can help offload some of the challenges of running a labor floor um, onto to these more standard platforms. So this is interesting. You know, when you talked about air traffic control, I just thought about, like, baby on runway five, baby on runway five. And yep. how do you convert that? Um, so... Impact? Would you say it was impactful? It sounds like you made a difference in the hospital floor, labor and delivery. Yeah. Um, so this system actually worked and made predictions in real time for real patients, real nurses. And, of course, nobody operated on it. This wasn't an FDA-approved device. Um, it just gave recommendations. But it was nonetheless a proof of concept that this could be done. Um, and we also extracted some very meaningful statistics about the patterns of decision-making and how nurse decision-making may change as a function of their workload. 
how many other patients are on the labor floor, what is the acuity of the floor. And I specifically am not going to take a stand on whether or not those changes in decision making are good or bad, but I think it necessitates us to look further at this to see are those changes actually a good thing. Um, and if they're not, then perhaps we can kind of standardize and, and extract what a nurse would decide if she were not busy and then potentially remind her or recommend to her, hey, this is what you would do if you had more time to think about it. I know you're really stressed and you don't have time to sit here for 30 minutes, but if you did, here's what I think you would do. And that's kind of what I'm most excited about is being able to have people sh expertly solve simpler problems and have the machine recommend for them in the more difficult cases, here's what I think you would do. So a decision maker or helping in decision making. Absolutely. And I'm partnering with the American Nurses Foundation, which is the research arm of the American Nurses Association, to start looking at nursing in the next few decades and how, in particular, AI will impact um, the healthcare profession in helping nurses to be ready and take advantage as much as they can of the, the growing technology. And so I'm hoping that this work will, will enable us to help um, nurses to cope with the lack of health professionals that we have as, as well as the increasing patient volume. No, this sounds wonderful. So healthcare, we talk about space, we talk about um, not automating people's job, but no. augmenting. Yeah, absolutely. And it's the conversation I've, I've had with this particular nursing, I think the nurses that I was working with at, at Beth Israel knew very well that I was never going to be able to automate their job. There was, there was never even a pretense because they know how difficult their job is and they knew how pathetic my little robot was compared to really how difficult and amazing it is to run a team of humans at high performance levels to be able to communicate knowledge, transfer that information. And I take the perspective of, can I automate 90% of the 5% of your job that makes you wanna quit, that burns you out, and that isn't really the reason you got into nursing in the first place. And same thing with, with NASA and astronauts is that we simply are missing out on a lot of really awesome science that could be conducted while we're waiting for our radio communications to go back and forth between Mars and Earth. And until we can get astronauts on these planets, um, or at least in orbit around Mars, um, you know, I think that there's a lot that can be gained from starting to build an autonomy. And NASA and JPL have started to look at that with their Aegis system where they'll have the robot manually commanded to drive to kind of the next interesting area that they want to look at. And then they'll run a computer vision algorithm to try to identify an interesting target of, of opportunity and, and zap it with their laser and take a measurement and send it back to Earth. Um, and so they're starting to look at ways of increasing science autonomy. And I think that's really awesome. Um, and I think that's exactly where we should be in starting to figure out not just what do computer scientists say are interesting rocks out there, but actually how do we learn from, from scientists on Earth? So this aspect of automation, and if I think about it in the concept of AI and machine learning, would you define it as imitation, uh, emulation, mimicry, humanization? Like, yeah, how would yeah. you define it? Um, uh, great question. So I actually take the perspective that automation doesn't necessarily have anything to do with machines. Um, if we think about nurses or doctors, whenever you make a checklist or a procedure, I argue that's a form of automation. And if the checklist is good and in, in aviation, checklists have saved lives. Um, it's a form of automation. It's taking power away perhaps from the pilot, but it is saving lives and helping to standardize practices, the best practice. Um, when we want to learn from nurses to try to codify or quote unquote automate a part of it, um, what we're trying to do is, is ultimately extract the way they do their job and understand why they do it so that we can best accomplish their goals. Um, that is what I call imitation, both an understanding of your goal and the way you want the job done. Um, most machine learning today fits into what um, a couple of categories, either mimicry or emulation. Mimicry would be, it's similar to the word mocking, is basically trying to mimic or replicate exactly what the person is doing without regard for their goal. So this is if you see a comedian on a late night show and they're kind of making physical gestures or speaking like somebody, 
That's that's mimicry, um, with a little flair of of hyperbole. Um, emulation would be trying to accomplish their goal without caring how they want you to accomplish this. This would be like getting in a taxi cab in New York and having the driver go about 120 miles an hour to get you to your destination. Hey, they got you there, but that's probably not how you would have done it. And I think the techniques that we're trying to work on are, are really trying to get at combining both is understanding your goal and accomplishing it in the way that you would have. So this is actually interesting. I haven't before described or heard described this concept of how we learn or how we augment human capability by this definition of imitation versus emulation versus mimicry, um, which is really, I guess, some of the issues that sometimes happen. Um, and so you would say that what you do is imitation. That's what I'd like to be doing. I don't think we're quite there yet. Um, I, I will make the perspective that a lot of what machine learning does in, in the community is fancy mimicry. And um, there's some good research that's shown, um, Bagnell and, and some others have shown that the best way to learn from humans is to set the robot up in a failure state and have the robot uh, be taught by the human how to recover from that error state. And if your data set, what you're learning from, is a set of corrections to failed um, states of the robot, then you can hopefully achieve the goal if you do it well enough. But there's still no feedback mechanism about what that goal is. And so um, we're working on trying to we combine mimicry with reasoning about the goals to then ultimately achieve imitation. Um, and you know, maybe I'll put the landmark out there, then in the next five years, maybe we'll get there. And so what then is good imitation? What is good imitation? That's a, that's a holy grail, so to speak, um, in our field. There was some work that I, I built a lot of my arguments for, for my dissertation off of out at Stanford Research Institute by Barry et al. And they focused on uh, emulation. So they'd ask people, what are your goals for how you like scheduling your calendar for meetings with other people? It sounds like a great thing, um, like a really good Siri. And they coded up this really monstrous quadratic program with all these optimization functions. And after like 10 years of work, they only ever got about 60% of the advice for when you should schedule a meeting with one of your office mates to be accepted. And kind of coming out of that work, what they said is like the tenets that researchers should have going forward is one, you need to understand the human's natural decision making process and seek to support that rather than replace it. And so ultimately, if we have these decision-making tools, if they're black box and they can't explain or show or convince to the user that might be using that decision um, why that decision was made and that you arrived at that decision in a very natural way, similar to the, how the person thinks, then it's ultimately going to prohibit adoption. And I think that's where we're stuck kind of today and why I'm looking at interpretable models instead of more black box neural networks is that we need to actually think like a person in order to have these models actually be of use to people. So being used to people. Um, I'm going to kind of end on this big picture of, of AI being useful to people. Yes. Um, so why do you think then people should understand this difference in these concepts of AI and machine learning and imitation and emulation. Like, why should people care? Why should they be listening to you about this conversation? Well, there's the first, you know, obsessive compulsive disorder part of me that says we have to get our definitions right just for the sake of getting definitions right. But the second argument I make is that it's important because we, a, we all will be consumers of this technology, and I think it's important that we understand what we're getting ourselves into when we buy something, when we adopt it, or if we make a recommendation to our company that this technology is useful. And to understand how it's making decisions will be critical to make an effective judgment about its use. And ultimately, if we don't have machines that understand how we want to accomplish our goals, um, we will end up in a situation, I think, where we become out of control of the technology itself. Um, there's a, a paperclip community. Um, that's, that's actually what they're called, where they believe that if you told a robot, hey, go make me paperclips, and that's all you said, that the robot would end up taking, machine, uh, taking metal from walls, 
from the fillings of your teeth and ultimately exhaust the resources of a planet to produce paper clips because it didn't have a bounded rationality or a concept of your goal and how you wanted to accomplish that goal or what your limitations would be for that goal. Um, and while I'm not exactly um, a disciple of that group, I do fully respect uh, their point that, that we need to understand how we're programming machines to get the desired outcomes that we want. So as consumers of technology, we really do need to understand the differences and the definitions of this whole world of machine learning, artificial intelligence, robotics. As a, as a computer programmer, I'm very confident that we uh, need to not just fully trust the computer scientist and actually uh, be engaged in understanding how these things work. And so with that, uh, we want to thank you. Uh, this has been a great conversation. Thank you very much for hosting me. It was, uh, it was a pleasure to be here, and I uh, look forward to coming back in the future someday. We want to thank Matthew Gambale for joining our podcast today. We'll have him back for another episode that will dive deeper into trust and machine learning in a couple of months. So be sure to keep an eye out for that. If you like what you heard and are interested in learning more or suggesting your own topics for the podcast, be sure to connect with us on Twitter or Facebook at IC at GT. Thanks for listening.